Great, so now we're gonna jump into organizational psychology. So if industrial psychology was really the psychology of how to grow a strong business and cut your losses with problematic employees and gain through retaining the gifted and strong employees, that's industrial psychology. What's organizational psychology? Well, this one has to do with business as well, but it's more about the employee side of things. If industrial psychology is how to grow a strong business, organizational psychology is how to grow a strong workforce. And so this is really the study of how people behave at work. Now, some Canadian psychologists would actually say industrial organizational psychology is really just the social psychology of workplaces, but others would disagree with you. But you can make up your own mind on that one. So when we talk about organizational psychology, it's more about what's going on in the employee's mind and how do they feel and how do they navigate the workplace. And so one big part of this is understanding work culture. Just like we can have different leaders, we can have different work cultures. And so this does overlap a lot with social psychology. This is the study of the social norms and the social roles. How is it in your workplace? Do people work really close in close proximity? Do they laugh as they carry on on the assembly line? Do people work more isolated and they barely see anybody else? Do people work in busy cubicles where they're irritated at their neighbors all day long? What are the social roles? Is there some people that come around and they cheer people up or they intimidate people or they make everybody go into a bad mood? What happens in the workplace? Is it filled with lots of harassment and intimidation? Is there a lot of competition in between employees? Or is it more inclusive and friendly? Do employees get together and go out for drinks? Or is it much more cold and professional? And so some of the things that can influence work culture are things like the communication style of the leaders and of the supervisors. If there is effective communication, if there's transparency and people know what's going on, this can help to improve a work culture. For some things are a bit more secret and behind closed doors, this can lead to a lot of problems, especially if there's some people that know some things and other people that don't. We also know that one thing we're interested in measuring work culture is the coworkers relationships. If it's in a small town and it's a factory in a small town and most people are cousins or neighbors, maybe they're going to have positive relationships or maybe they're actually going to have neighborly grudges at work. If the coworkers come from more diverse backgrounds, is there something to help them learn how to get along and learn how to be sensitive to that diversity? Or is it going to be more bumpy than that? And how satisfied are the workers in their job? If you're working with a very disgruntled workforce, let's say you're working with a bunch of bus drivers who haven't gotten raised in a long time, are those bus drivers really disgruntled and not turning in their buses on time and then helping and then hindering the person who has the bus on the next shift? Are they more satisfied in their job and more cheerful? So what is the work culture like? The next big step is looking at motivation. If the work culture is not good, we want to at least make sure our workers are motivated. And there's lots of theories of motivation we can go into. If you think back to unit 10, we talked about self-determination theory, and that is huge in industrial organizational psychology. And that's because we know that employees and workers will actually be intrinsically motivated in the right sort of way. They will be intrinsically motivated if they have autonomy on the job, if they're not being overly heavily supervised or having their computer screened by their boss, if they feel competent and challenged, but in just the right zone. So there's a little bit of flow we talked about at the end of last unit and flows the idea of that optimal challenge where you feel in the zone and everything's going great. And so this comes from positive psychology, but we also see this in organizational psychology, that if employees don't have too much challenge or too little challenge, they'll actually feel really engaged in their work. And what will also motivate them is if they feel really related, if they feel connected to others when they do their work. So we can see how taking a leadership role like Theory X and a much more top-down authoritarian workplace would really take away all of these. It would be more cold and transactional, there wouldn't be relatedness, there wouldn't be a lot of autonomy, and you might be over-challenging or under-challenging people. If they're just on an assembly line putting one little simple thing together, we can imagine that would be under-challenging. Or if they have a huge workload of many things and not a lot of support, that would be too challenging. And so when organizations look at the motivation of their workforce, they wonder how they can implement policies and rules to increase that motivation. And a lot of times what they start off with is incentives. It might be something like beefing up the staff room or giving more breaks or uh, giving out t-shirts or watches or some sort of little deal like that. And there's been a lot of research into what type of incentive will retain and excite employees more. And the real goal here is to make employees go along this arrow. 
It's believed that at one end, employees are not motivated at all. The task is really boring and they might not even do it. They might slack off. And that's considered a motivation. That means they're not motivated. If you ask them to do it, it's really going to go on the end or the bottom of their priority list. Then we have when they will do it for an incentive. That's the extrinsic motivation. And so at first, they'll only do it if you are really holding their hand and pressuring them to. If they have to do it, otherwise they're going to be in trouble. It's just the idea they have to turn their time cards or they won't get paid. And so that's the idea that you are really controlling them. They don't really do it autonomously. And then it's the idea that you can extrinsically motivate them, but they are doing it autonomously. It's optional, and now they're doing it. And it's the idea that whichever employee makes the most sales in a month will get a prize. So they don't have to do it, but they'll buy in and they'll do it autonomously. And then finally, you want to get them up to that intrinsic motivation where now you don't need the incentives, you don't need the pressure. It's really going to be the autonomy, competence, and relatedness that's going to get them to get the job done. Some tasks will have people in that intrinsic motivation right from the get-go. Some tasks you have to initiate them up the arrow. And so this is the idea of getting them into that extrinsic motivation can work. We can see this in educational settings too. It's the idea that students may not be motivated until it's for a test and then it's more about the extrinsic controlled motivation where they have to do the test to get the grade. But then there might be some other things that is free choice like getting them to come to class. They might be skipping out on lectures but now if there's like some sort of bonus question they give away in, in that or there's some sort of help or mentoring maybe they'll come to lectures and then eventually you want to get those students that are engaged just because they like learning. And so you can move up the arrow in education as well. So organizational psychology is about studying the work culture, about studying the motivation. And when we think about that motivation, the reason why that matters is that can really influence worker efficiency. A big part of organizational psychology is trying to get the most productivity out of employees as possible. So making sure they're healthy and making sure they are doing okay is a big part of that. You want to prevent job strain and job burnout. But at the same time, you want to make them as productive as possible without that burnout. Now, historically, there's been some problems in this area. One of them is with the Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect is the idea that, at least in the short term, it was discovered that employees work harder and are more productive when they're being watched. And it was the idea that unwashed employees might slack off for a couple minutes here and there. And so because of this, this is what really enforced Theory X with that really focused supervisory authoritarian uh, leadership style. And so it's the idea with the Hawthorne effect that if you do not have floor supervisors, people on the assembly line will slack off or people will only or people will dilly dally and take some time and take some social time and won't get as much work done. So because of the Hawthorne effect, it was the idea that we had to constantly supervise. But that doesn't work in the long term. What actually happens is without downtime, we tend to get really burnt out. Employees are more likely to go off on disability more frequently. And then we actually find that if you're looking at not just minute by minute or hour by hour, if you're looking at over months of what you can get out of an employee, it's actually better if you give them some downtime and give them some breaks and give them ability to stretch every once in a while. If they're doing a mental task on the computer, allowing them to get up and go use the washroom and take a walk around whenever they feel the need is important. Or if they're doing something physical such as shoveling or doing construction, allowing them to have a couple breathers is important. We've all driven by construction crews on a break and think, oh geez, are they always on breaks? But the breaks are actually essential to their work. As someone who works in a very mental industry, it's the idea that when you're writing an essay or preparing a lecture, it's not just about the time you're clicking on a keyboard. There's the downtime that's important too that gets everything percolating in your brain before you can write a document. And so that downtime actually increases productivity. We see some employers take this the wrong way. They take this advice the wrong way, of course, where they absolutely grind their employees in a very short term and then fire them and get a new workload and then fire them. And they say, oh, if, if not allowing downtime means that they're less productive over months, but they're more productive in the short term, we'll just hire people for three month chunks and then have a high turnover rate. And we can see that happen in a lot of unethical businesses where people don't make it past the three month uh, probationary period. Again, when we think about worker efficiency, there is a cost with allowing your company to have high turnover like that. So we want to think about the cost of retaining talent versus having to retrain people constantly. And so if you want to retain the talent that you have, you have to try and think about how much job strain the employees are facing. 
So we covered this in the last unit in one of the readings, but I want to emphasize that job strain really increases as our workload increases and as our autonomy at the job goes down. And this is the idea that you feel like you have no freedom, but you have so much you have to do. And this can happen in unskilled laborers, this can happen in blue collar tradespeople, and it can happen in white collar employees as well. And when job strain gets out of hand, it can lead to the even worse job burnout. And that has three big areas we're going to talk about. It's the fatigue. And the fatigue is not particularly physical, it's psychological and emotional. And it's the idea a good person who actually wants to do a good job cannot focus on their job. They absolutely are tired and they will do anything but. And it's not procrastination, it's just they are exhausted and they can't put their brain there. And it's because we're not designed to work really long hours every day. Another big part of this of burnout is you start to feel hostile towards your coworkers, towards the public you're working with, towards your patrons, towards your supervisors, and normally you wouldn't be that hostile of a person. That someone who's high in agreeableness would all of a sudden start to feel really nasty towards their workers. And the last one is they feel undervalued and underappreciated. They feel like their work goes completely unnoticed and nobody cares about them. And we know there's some industries where this is just a given and it's expected that you're going to put up with this job burnout and it's a thankless job. But there's other areas where we hope this doesn't happen and when it happens, we try to act to make it better. The last area of organizational psychology I'm gonna talk about, it actually kind of fits in both industrial and organizational, but it's the idea of using our knowledge of IO psychology for a better world. And it's not just improving companies, but really trying to help people get a leg up in these companies. And this is the Humanitarian Work Psychology, or HWP. It was really founded in 2012, and it's really about helping marginalized demographics transition to this workforce, especially to the white collar workforce and the social norms. Because work culture is a lot about social norms, if you change the line of work that you're in from blue collar to white collar, from private to public industry, the work culture is going to change. And it might be something that's completely unfamiliar to you and the way you respond to people and the way you self-disclose at work or talk to people at work can be very different. And so this is explicit coaching and professionals training to help those marginalized demographics to make a transition to particular workforces. It's something to understand the professional norms required for resumes and interviews and fitting in with the culture so they can do what's called coding. And it allows them also to have someone to talk to and find counselors to help deal with the stress of this work acclimatization, especially if they are new to not just the workplace, but the country or the city that they're in. So this, of course, is going to help a lot of people who have been historically not allowed to work, such as women in higher CEO positions, people of color, people with disabilities, such as mobility disabilities, or, or people who are deaf or blind at workplaces, as well as people that are of a sexual minority or a religious minority. It could be something like helping other Muslim workers find ways to talk about needing to pray during the workday, or finding tricks or hacks to get the prayers in during the workday or the idea of how to bring up your pronouns in an interview, for instance. And so the humanitarian work psychology is this relatively new area of psychology aimed at trying to decode a lot of the coding work in IO psychology for everyone so we can all succeed and to make the workforce more equitable.